Peace, Alafia, Shalom, Assalamu Alaikum. I am your host, The Last Grill. To know thyself is to know your history. And in this series, we'll be breaking down the history of the West African country, Sierra Leone. Did you know that archaeological finds show that Sierra Leone has been inhabited continuously for at least 2,500 years, populated successively by societies who migrated from other parts of Western and Central Africa? Its earliest documentation is noted as an outpost or outer territory of the Great Mali Empire, and the following centuries would slowly see Sierra Leone become a place of refuge for those escaping Islamic conversion, enslavement, and warfare from larger nations. There are 18 different ethnic groups in Sierra Leone today. The indigenous tribes of Sierra Leone would be the Limba, Polo, and Loco. The other 14 would migrate into the region in later periods. Those who came from Mali and Guinea would become the Timni, Mende, Madingo, Kono, Yalunka, Karunko, Suzu, and Kizi. Sierra Leone would also receive the Karu, Karim, Kalina, Gola, and Vai from Liberia. The Creole people would be a result of liberated slaves from the Americas being resettled in Sierra Leone by the British. They have one of the most interesting stories because the Creole today are the closest African relatives of black Americans due to their ancestors having to leave behind parents, siblings, uncles, and aunties behind in America, Canada, and the Caribbean. The Creoles today still bear the same English surnames as their family who remained in America. For example, if you're from the Williams family in South Carolina, you may have a great-grandfather who migrated to Sierra Leone and continued another lineage of the Williams family there. The Limba are believed to be the earliest indigenous people of Sierra Leone. They speak a distinctive language that is unrelated to other languages in Sierra Leone. They are primarily found in the northern province, particularly in Bambali district, Koinadugu, Kambia, and Tonkolili, but a small number can still be found in Guinea. During Sierra Leone's colonial era, thousands of Limbas migrated to the capital city of Freetown and its western area. During the 16th, 17th, and 18th century, many Limba people were shipped to North America as slaves. The Limba are mainly rice farmers, traders, and hunters who lived in the Savannah Woodland region in the northern province of Sierra Leone. They predominate in 16 out of 190 rural chiefdoms in the country, and their community affairs are dominated by the local Paramount chiefs. Major Limba towns include Bafodia, the Warawara Yagala Chiefdom, Kamakui, Pinkolo, Madina, Fadugo, Kamasasa, Mabonto, and Kamasigi. The Bolom, Limba, and Loko were already original inhabitants of Sierra Leone. Tribes like the Shebro, Timni, and Mende would also become known as early inhabitants, but the formation of these tribes and the regions they inhabit would be carved out by the Mani people after they invaded and conquered most of the country in the 16th century. To fully understand the story of the Bolom, Shebro, Loko, Timni, and Mende, we must first understand the story of the Mani people. There are many origin theories of the Mani, including their origin stemming from a female leader called Masoriko, who was expelled from the Mali Empire after offending the Mansa because she thought his leadership was weak and left with a large army of Mani warriors who helped her conquer, subjugate, and absorb the native tribes of the new lands and forced their prisoners of war to join their army. Historically and culturally, though, a more precise location of origin would be Kabu. The Mani were warlords and rulers of the Mandinka elite from the declining Mali Empire, but their homeland was a vassal state of Mali at the time called Kabu. Kabu was formed by a war general called Turamagan Triore in French West Africa or Turamagan Tarawali in English-speaking West Africa. Turamagan was the general and nephew of the founder of the Mali Empire, Sanjata Keita, through Sanjata's elder sister, Nana Tribon. In the 1230s, Turamagan defeated a great Bainuk king called Kikakor and formed Gabu as a western province of Mali, and Turamagan would name himself the first Mansaba of the vassal state. Gabu was based in modern-day Guinea-Bissau, but their territory would also expand into the Senegambia as well. Once Turamagan defeated the Bainuk king, he would marry a Jola woman, who was a known powerful sorceress. His descendants would take on the surnames Sane and Mane, which were both of Jola origin as well. The ruling class was composed of warrior elites made rich by slaves captured in war. These ruling nobles were from two distinctive sets of clans, Koring and Nyanko, 
The Korings were from Sanyang and Sonko clans, whilst the Nyankos were Mane and Sane. The Korings ruled the non-royal provinces, while only those descended from Nyanko bloodlines on both sides would be elected as Mansa. When we look at the timeline of Mali, Gabu, and the Mani invasion of Sierra Leone, Guinea, and Liberia, it becomes easier to tie in the knots. After the middle of the 14th century, Mali saw a steep decline due to the raids by the Mosi in the south and the growth of the new Songhai Empire to the north, as well as secession disputes. The Mali Empire would continue declining in the late 1400s, especially under the rule of Mansa Mahmud Keita II, who came to rule in 1481. His reign was described as a period where Mali would lose much of its territory. Mansa Mahmud was likely the Mansa who the Mani leader Masariko offended because weak leadership seems to be synonymous with his reign, and it was said that Masariko's conquest towards Guinea, Sierra Leone, and Liberia had begun in the early 1500s, not too long after Mahmud would come into power and Gabu would become independent from Mali in the year 1537. After Masariko's expulsion, her and the Mani would establish themselves in the Bela region of Musadugu in modern-day Guinea. From Guinea, they would travel further south until reaching Cape Mount, Liberia, where the border is shared with southeastern Sierra Leone. Upon entering these regions, the Mani would encounter the indigenous Bulum people at Cape Mount in 1845. The Bulum were indigenous to Sierra Leone, Liberia, and Guinea. At Cape Mount, the Mani and Bulum would fight a major battle against each other where Masariko's son was killed and she died soon after. The rest of her army would continue west and conquer the southern regions of Sierra Leone. From the south, they would make their way towards the northern region of the country, absorbing and assimilating those they defeated along the way. Once the Mani entered the southern region of Sierra Leone, many Bulum settlements were destroyed during these invasions. This enabled the Mandinka to fully take over the South and force the Bullum to give them their allegiance. After the Mani conquered this region, they would begin intermixing with the Bullum people and this fusion of the Mani and the Bullum would form the Mende tribe who inhabit the same region today. The name Mende may derive from the names of their conquerors Mani or a spin-off to the ancestry of their conquerors which is Mande, the umbrella term for the Mande-speaking people of West Africa. <laughs> or perhaps when the Europeans made contact with them and asked who they were, the reply that they received was Mande. But the British pronunciation likely came out as Mandai, hence the pronunciation and spelling today. Corruption and mispronunciation of African names and words by European explorers and invaders was common. And whatever they documented on the African people would be what was passed down to us who are the descendants, including the improper way of saying some of our ancestral names. Another example of this can be displayed through the formation of the Shebro people. After conquering the Bulum people of the south and forming the Mende, the next region that the Mani would conquer would be the Bulum territory centered around what is today known as Shebro Island. The head of this conquest was a Mani leader named Sherabola. A corruption of this name would lead to him being called Shebro, and from the corruption of this Mani leader's name, the Shebro tribe was formed. From there, the Timni would be conquered next, but prior to the Mani invasion of Sierra Leone, the Timni would be the first migrant tribe to arrive in the country after leaving the Futa Jalon region of Guinea in the late 1400s. The Timni would push the Limba northeast and the Bulum southward. It is highly possible that before the arrival of the Mani, the Timni may have possibly gone by a different name. It is important to note that unlike other modern Mande groups, the Timni are related to the Landuma, Nalu, and Baga people of Guinea and Guinea-Bissau. These groups have been described as pre-Mandinkas because they settled in the region before the arrival of the Mande people. I find it interesting that the Soneninke people also predate the Mandinka as well, yet there is still record of this pre-existence. But there is no record of the Timni until they made their presence in Sierra Leone, which heavily indicates that prior to them settling there, they likely were identifying under a different name or originally a subgroup of the Baga people. More evidence of this is that the Timni language is included within the Baga language family. The Timni government, titles of power, and culture is heavily influenced from the Mande and Kru-speaking Mani, 
So it is not unlikely that after subjugation, the conquered group took on a new name, culture, and form of governance, just as the Bullam did in the South when they became the Mende and Shebro tribes. These are other spelling variations of Timni that are listed below. The most consistent factor is the mani, mene, and mini suffix at the end of each variation. Despite the various spelling variations, Timni only has two ways of pronouncing it, which is Timni or Timani. And this still maintains the mani or mini suffix, showing further indication that their name is derived from the Mani warriors who conquered them. When Masariko and the Mani started their conquest, her lieutenants were referred to as Sumbas and consisted of Karu speaking people of the Koya and Kia clans from Liberia, who were likely absorbed into the army after the Mani conquered regions in Liberia. As the Mani generals were conquering the southern region of Sierra Leone, the Lieutenant Sumbas may have led the northern conquest against the Timni, because the Timni would go on to form the Kingdom of Koya, fully indicating that the Sumbas from the Koya clan played a major role in conquering them. The first three kings of Koya were documented by the name Farima, which wasn't their actual name but a title. Farima is a Mandinka term that translates to brave man, commander, or military leader in a Mandinka army. This is full evidence that after the Koya clan conquered the Timni, the Mani generals would be who took kingship. So now the newly formed Mende, Shebro, and Timni would become fully assimilated and trained to be a part of the Mani army. The Timni would conquer the Loko and intermix with them heavily, becoming the ruling class amongst them. The only tribe that was able to bring a halt to the Mani conquest in the north were the Susu. Overall, the Mani were able to conquer and absorb the Bullam and then create hybrid groups that would form the Mende, Shebro, Timni, and Loko. Salon Mandem, them always like for say, Uda indigenous, Uda not so indigenous. <laughs> well, I come for tell you now, if you not so limba, you yourself, you not so indigenous, you not foreign man. Basically, what I said was, Sierra Leoneans often enter into petty tribalistic debates over who's indigenous to the land and who's not. But in reality, if you're not Limba, then you're not fully indigenous to the land either. The Bullam would have been another indigenous group, but they've been fully absorbed and assimilated into the current tribes existing today. The Mende, Shebro, and Loko would be the next closest thing, but they only have partial indigenous ancestry from the Bullam, while the other half comes from the Mandinka invaders. Then the Timni are just foreigners who intermix with foreigners. They are a mixture of the Baga people of Guinea, Mandinka from the Mani clan, Karu people from the Koya and Kia clan, and a small percentage of Bullam sprinkled in there. The rest of the tribes in Sierra Leone are migrants from Mali, Guinea, and Liberia who settled later on. So I think we all labor for say, Salon not a real place. We all not foreign man. <laughs> We come salon, we fed the bolom, we fed the limba, and we tell them, say, you go accept we. If you don't accept we, we don't go have peace in this country. Ah. So this indigenous debate, not a thing where we get for fed sports. Today, all man are salon man. You hear me? All man are salon man. So now that we've broken down the Mani invasion, we're now able to go into other tribes as well too that migrated from other regions. The Susu and Yalunka are traders who originally migrated from Guinea to Sierra Leone. Both groups are primarily found in the far north in Cambia and Koinadugu district, close to the border with Guinea. The Susu and Yalunka kingdom was established in the early 5th to 7th century before the Mali Empire, which was extended from Mali, Senegal, Guinea-Bissau, Guinea-Kanakri, and the northern part of Sierra Leone. They are among the original inhabitants of the Futa Jalon region in Guinea. The Susu and Yalunka are descendants of the greater Mande people, and today they are virtually all Muslim. The Yalunka, also Spanish Jalonke, are Mande people who have lived in the Jalon mountainous regions in Sierra Leone, Mali, Senegal, Guinea-Bissau, and Guinea-Kanakri, West Africa, over 520 years ago. The name Yalunka literally means inhabitants of Jalon. Most of those who settled in Sierra Leone were pushed out by the Fula. The Susu are descendants of their Manding ancestors who lived in the mountainous Mali Guinea border. They are said to have originally been a section of the Sonaninke people that migrated out of Wagadu and were initially a clan of blacksmiths who displayed their clear intentions to object converting to Islam. 
in the 12th century, when the kingdom of Ouagadou was in decline, they migrated south and established the capital city of Susu in the mountainous region of Kodikoro. In Kodikoro, the Yalunka sub-tribe of the Susu would form during the tyrannical reign of Susumaru Kante. After Sanjata Keita defeated Kante, the Susus were ruled by the 13th century Mali Empire. In the 15th century, they migrated west to the Futa Jalon Plateau of Guinea as the Mali Empire disintegrated, but may have had earlier migrations as well. The Kono people are descendants of Mali Guinean migrants who were said to have moved to Sierra Leone and settled in what is now the Kono district in the mid 16th century. Kono history claims that Kono were once a powerful people in Mali and Guinea. The Kono migrated to Sierra Leone as peaceful hunters. The tribe was split during the partitioning of Africa by European colonists and part of the tribe still exist in the neighboring Guinea. Kono comes from the Mande word Makono, which means wait until we come back. So the Kono are actually just Mandinka people who were cut off from the others after Sierra Leone became separate from Guinea. Attacks from the related Mende people forced the Kono to seek refuge in the Karonko territory to the north, where they were allowed to farm the land. The Mende eventually moved further south and the Kono returned to their land in the east. The Kono today practice Christianity, Islam, and traditional religion. They are primarily miners and farmers and they make up 5.2% of the country's total population. Their homeland is the Kono district in eastern Sierra Leone. The Gisi are the fourth largest ethnic group in Guinea, making up 6.2% of the population. Gisi people are found in Liberia and Sierra Leone. The Kisi tradition considers that before the 17th century, they inhabited the Upper Niger region. Supposedly, they lived south of the Futa Jalon until the Alunka expelled them. After 1600, they migrated westward, expelling the Limbas in their march, but were under constant threat from the Caroncos. This threat is likely what caused their migration into Sierra Leone. The Gisi are well known for making baskets and weaving on vertical looms. In past times, they were also famous for their iron working skills, as the country and its neighbors possessed rich deposits of iron. Kisi Smiths produced the famous Kisi Penny, which was a form of currency in the Mande speaking world in the form of iron. The Karonko people occupy a large section in the mountainous regions of northeastern Sierra Leone and southern Guinea. Karonko speak a language similar to the Manding languages and their language can be understood by their neighbors and close allies, the Mandinka and the Susu. The Karonko moved into Sierra Leone from Mali after some leadership struggles in the empire. It is highly likely that the Karonko were originally a subgroup of the Mandingo and like the Mani, they may have decided to leave Mali altogether due to the weak leadership of Mansa Mahmud during the declining status of the empire. But during the height of Mali, the Karankos were originally a part of the military power of the country. Due to the vastness of the empire and their role in the military, they were deployed across East to West Africa. One of the most prominent military groups was led by a warrior named Mansa Kama, who lived approximately between 1650 and 1720. He was in charge of securing the West African trade route to the ports in present-day Freetown. Mansa Kama founded Kamadugu, now contained within the Sengbe Chitum of Konadugu district, as well as Kolifa, which is still a Chitum to this day, and extended his rule across Sierra Leone, Fore Dugu, to the port in Koya. Matsakama eventually settled in Roala, which became the center of the new Karanko country, where he remained a leader until his death. The Karanko are primarily traders, farmers, and hunters, and followers of the Islamic faith today. The Mandingo people of Sierra Leone are direct descendants of people from Guinea and Mali who were traders, warriors, princes, Muslim clerics, and refugees who settled Sierra Leone between the 1870s and early 1900s. The main two reasons for their migration into the country was usually escaping French colonialism and enslavement back in Mali or Guinea, or the second reason would be fleeing or being subjugated by the jihads led by Samori Tore, a ruler of the Wasulu Empire. After Wasulu fell to the French in 1898, many of its subjects settled in Guinea and Sierra Leone. The Kenadugu Empire, ruled by the Traore, also known as Tarawali, would also fall to the French in the same year after they defeated Babemba Traore in battle. 
This would lead to some of their subjects also settling in Guinea and Sierra Leone and attempt to evade French colonialism. In fact, the Koinadugu district of Sierra Leone was likely named by the Mandinka descendants of Kenadugu. Today, the Mandingo are predominantly traders and farmers. They constitute about 7% of Sierra Leone's population. The Mandingo are over 99% Muslim adherents to the Sunni tradition of Islam. The population is largely concentrated in Koinadugu district in the north, particularly in the towns of Kabbalah and Falaba, where they form the majority of the population. The Mandingo make up a majority of the population in Yangema, Kono district in eastern Sierra Leone, and they also make up a majority of the population in the town of Karina and Bambali district in the north of Sierra Leone. The Fula people are descendants of 17th and 18th century Fulani migrant settlers from the Futa Jalon regions of Guinea, Mali, Senegal, and Mauritania. The Sierra Leone Fula people settled in the western area of Sierra Leone more than 60 years ago as settlers from mainly the Futa Jalon region expanded to the northern part of Sierra Leone, primarily Kabbalah and Bambali. The Sierra Leone and Fula are traditionally a nomadic pastoralist trading people, herding cattle, goats, and sheep across the vast dry hinterlands of their domain, keeping somewhat separate from the local agricultural populations. Many of the large shopping centers in Sierra Leone are owned and run by the Fula community. A significant number of the Sierra Leone Fula population are found in all regions of Sierra Leone as traders, and many live in middle-class homes. Because of their trading, the Fulas are found in nearly all parts of the country. The Kru, Vai, and Gola are tribes that inhabit Sierra Leone today, but originally come from Liberia and Cote d'Ivoire. They migrated and settled along various points of West African coast, notably Freetown, Sierra Leone, but also the Ivorian and Nigerian coast. The Kuru are a large ethnic group that is made up of several sub-ethnic groups, including the Basa, who also inhabit Sierra Leone to a small percentage. During the Atlantic slave trade, Kuru people were considered more valuable as traders and sailors on slave ships than as slave labor. To ensure their status as free men, they initiated the practice of tattooing their foreheads and the bridge of their nose with indigo dye to distinguish them from slave labor. Their maritime expertise evolved along the west coast of Africa where they made a living as fishermen and traders. Knowing the inshore waters of the western coast of Sierra Leone in Africa and having nautical experience, they were employed as sailors, navigators, and interpreters aboard slave ships as well as American and British warships used against the slave trade. The Sierra Leonean Vi are predominantly found in Pujaun district, around the Liberian border. Many Sierra Leonean villages that border Liberia are populated by the Vi. In total, only about 1,200 Vi live in Sierra Leone. They were referred to as the Galena people by the Portuguese and began migrating southwest, crossing Sierra Leone borders in search of salt and cola. The Gola people are a sub-tribe of the Koya clan from Liberia. During the Mani invasion, it is highly likely that the Koya who went north and conquered the Baga would become the Timni, and the Koya who remained in the southern region of Sierra Leone by the Liberian border would become the Gola. So the Gola are a combination of the Mani from the Mandinka clan, the Koya clan from Liberia, and the indigenous Bolon people. This makes them closely related to the Timni, the Baga, Shebro, Mende, and Kisi tribes as well. The Gola people are also called the Gullah, and during the transatlantic slave trade, many slaves were captured from the Gola tribe as well as Mendi and sent to the Sea Islands of South Carolina to work on rice plantations due to their specialty in this field. The Gola and Gisi people of Sierra Leone and the Bantu people from Angola are said to be the origin of the name Gullah Geechee in South Carolina. Though most scholars would agree, that the word Gullah in reference to the Gullah Geechee people of South Carolina is derived from the Gola people of Sierra Leone and the Bantu speaking people of Angola. Some scholars would say that the word Geechee is derived from the Ogeechee River in South Carolina and Georgia, or some would say that it comes from the Kisi people or the Gisi people of Liberia and Guinea. And last but not least, we have the Creole people. Who are the Sierra Leonean Creole people? Where did they come from? The Creole people of Sierra Leone have a unique story and ancestry. They are not considered to be one of the indigenous tribes of Sierra Leone because of their history and origins. 
the Creole people's origins come from various parts of West and Central Africa. From 1619 to the mid 1700s, their ancestors were captured from these regions and enslaved in the America and the Caribbean. They were predominantly being sent to the American colonies of Virginia, the Carolinas, Georgia, and Florida. Their ancestors would become amongst those who would help to form the Gullah Geechee community. In 1775 to 76, the Revolutionary War would begin. A major event that initiated it would be when the Americans decided to declare its independence from Britain and form the United States of America. This declaration was written up by Thomas Jefferson and he identifies the inhabitants of the 13 colonies as one people. The declaration simultaneously dissolved political links with Britain while including a long list of alleged violations of English rights committed by King George III. The British wanted to maintain control over its colonies and they would attempt to do so by any means, even through warfare if necessary. This tension between Britain and America created a dilemma where the Americans had to choose who they would give their allegiance to. The American patriots referred to those who supported independence and freedom from Britain. The loyalists were white Americans who were still remaining loyal to the British crown. But to increase the numbers in their troops and cripple the economy of America, the British incentivized the black slaves owned by the patriots to join the British troops in exchange for their freedom. They would go on to be called the Black Loyalists. In November 1775, Lord Dunmar issued a controversial proclamation. As Virginia's royal governor, he called on all able-bodied men to assist him in fighting against the Patriots. Within a month, about 800 slaves or former slaves had fled to Norfolk, Virginia to enlist. Lord Dunmar would take these 800 former slaves and form an army called the Ethiopian Regiment. A link to a small list of former slaves from his morning reports from those who accompanied him will be shared below. After the capture of Savannah, Georgia and the siege of Charleston in 1780, thousands of enslaved people escaped from plantations and fled to British lines in Charleston to join their troops. America would defeat the British in 1781, but fortunately, the British still upheld their deal with the formerly enslaved black loyalists. In 1783, about 3,000 blacks were registered in the Book of Negroes, a document that records the names, descriptions, former masters, and the different states that these former slaves came from. Due to their fugitive status in America, they were also granted certificates of freedom and evacuated out of the country via New York to Nova Scotia, Canada. The white loyalists would also be evacuated with them as well. The black loyalists who were not evacuated to Nova Scotia would be resettled in Jamaica or London. Those who went to London would be referred to as the quote-unquote poor blacks of London. Though these blacks in London were predominantly formerly enslaved people, they were also blacks who descended from Jewish and Muslim Moors who invaded and resided in Europe from North Africa and held power from 711 AD to 1492 when they were defeated at Granada. Around 1596, Queen Elizabeth I expressed her annoyance of the Black Amor's presence still lingering in London, even after most of them were deported back to North Africa. So together, a branch of Black loyalists from America and the Black Moors made up the poor Blacks of London. Due to their extreme poverty and state of hopelessness, a resettlement scheme was formed to relocate them to the new British colony of Sierra Leone. By the end of October 1786, a transport ship was commissioned and docked at Deptford. The applicants for the settlement were to sign an agreement agreeing to the condition that they would retain status as British subjects and were to be defended by the British armed forces. They were then given a document granting them citizenship of Sierra Leone. They initially had 700 blacks who signed up, but only 441 of them actually went through with it. In January of 1787, Two ships called the Atlantic and the Belisarius set sail for Sierra Leone, but bad weather forced them to divert to Plymouth, during which time about 50 passengers died. Another 24 were discharged and 23 ran away. Eventually, after more recruitment, 411 passengers set sail for Sierra Leone in April of 1787. On the voyage between Plymouth and Sierra Leone, 96 passengers died en route, which left only 315. 
The ones that managed to survive the voyage arrived on the shore of Sierra Leone on May 15, 1787 and established Granville Town, which was basically a proto-freetown. When the ships left them in September, their numbers had been reduced to 276 people, consisting of 212 black men, 30 black women, 5 white men, and 29 white women. The settlers that remained forcibly captured a land from an African chief, but he retaliated, attacking the settlement, which reduced their numbers to 64 settlers, now consisting of 39 black men, 19 black women, and 6 white women. Unfortunately, some of these settlers would be recaptured by slave raiders and sold back into slavery, mostly in Spanish and Portuguese-speaking countries. After Granville Town failed and the population was nearly decimated, the British organizers of Sierra Leone had a new resettlement plan, and they needed to repopulate the colony. So this time, they decided to recruit the black loyalists who were evacuated from America to Nova Scotia. Prior to the recruitment, the black loyalists had already been expressing their unsatisfaction and grievances about their conditions in Nova Scotia. The land was not fertile, the weather was harsh, and the white loyalists were subjugating the black loyalists and taking most of the jobs. They would leave them with the menial work or force them into a situation where they would have to succumb to indented servitude. All of these tribulations were documented by a black loyalist named Thomas Peters. He and many other influential blacks of the community were pressing out the British crown to fulfill their promises to the blacks, such as promise of land grants. The British had no resistance to these requests because the timing of it all fell completely in alignment with the goals and agenda of the British crown and the heads of Sierra Leonean resettlement plan. They needed to repopulate the Sierra Leone colony and the black loyalists of Canada were the perfect candidates. So in 1792, Roughly 1,200 out of the 3,000 black loyalists were recruited to be resettled in Sierra Leone. And because of their former slave status in the Americas, these settlers would name the capital Freetown as a symbol of their liberation. This group formed a successful society unlike their predecessors who came from London. Meanwhile, in Jamaica, there was a group of black rebels called the Maroons. They were former slaves who escaped their plantations then settled amongst the Taino Indians in the mountainous regions of the island, where they would eventually form multiple communities of refuge for runaway slaves to join. The Maroons fought two wars against the British, and after the second war, the main leaders, instigators, and people of influence in the Maroon community were deported off of the island. In 1796, 581 Trelawney Maroons were transported to Nova Scotia, but another 58 stayed behind in Jamaica and either forged careers as free persons of color or joined a Kompong town. During the ship's voyage, 17 Maroons died. During the first winter between 1796 and 97, which was a bitter one, another 19 Maroons died. During this winter, another five Maroons were born, and in 1797, the surgeon John Oxley counted 550 Maroons in Nova Scotia. The Maroons, like their black loyalist predecessors, were unsatisfied with their resettlement in Nova Scotia and requested to be settled in the Sierra Leone colony. So in the year 1800, the Maroons were resettled in the Sierra Leone colony amongst the black loyalists who also came from Nova Scotia. In 1807, the British would abolish slavery in all of its colonies, but this would not stop countries like Spain and Portugal from still making illegal slave raids on liberated and native blacks in the British colonies of Africa. In 1808, following the British declaring the abolition of slavery, they would form the West African Squadron. Their role was to suppress the Atlantic slave trade by patrolling the coast of West Africa. This was successful to a large degree because they were able to intercept a large percentage of slave ships that raided the coast and attempted to transport them to places like Cuba and Brazil. After these ships were intercepted, these recaptives would be settled in Sierra Leone and they would be known as liberated Africans. In 1827, some of the Sierra Leone Creoles would be recruited and transported to Bioko Island in Equatorial Guinea to take up work on cocoa and yam plantations. They are heavily populated in the Malabo region. Over time, a full Creole community would form in Equatorial Guinea, known as the Fernandinos. In the 1830s, the Saro community emerged out of the Sierra Leonean Creole group, and they would begin migrating to Nigeria. They were liberated Africans and children of the liberated Africans, ancestrally from the Yoruba, 
who resettled in Sierra Leone after the slave ships they were being transported on were intercepted by Britain's West African squadron. They would serve as middlemen between Sierra Leone and Nigeria. Another Creole group that would emerge would be called the Aku people. The Aku people were Sierra Leonean captives whose slave ships were intercepted by the British, but instead of being resettled back in Sierra Leone, they were resettled in Gambia. These Gambian Aku were also ancestrally Yoruba, but there were also Aku who descend from the Nova Scotian and Caribbean black loyalists who were settled in Sierra Leone initially, but migrated to Gambia. While living in Sierra Leone, many Creole residents became exposed to the Christian faith as a result of the work of British missionaries who established some churches, a few grammar schools, and a pioneer educational institution, the Fora Bay College. Relatively, the residents of Sierra Leone soon gained a fast start in Western education and were soon well trained and experienced in medicine, law, and the civil service. Many of them graduated from grammar schools and became administrative workers for the British imperial interest in the country. By the middle of the 19th century, some of the African elite in Sierra Leone began to migrate to Nigeria, especially the colony of Lagos for economic reasons. Some were administrative personnel who were reassigned to Lagos. An expedition of the River Niger by Ajayi Crowther furthered the evangelical interest of many Sierra Leoneans toward Nigeria, many of them having joined the missionaries in their effort. In 1841, an estimated 200 Maroons in Sierra Leone responded to the British call for indented labor in Jamaica on sugar plantations. They would resettle to the Jamaican Maroon village of Flagstaff in St. James Parish. A branch of the Creoles from the Black Loyalist wave would also be a part of this emigration, mainly for economic purposes. Some would return back to Sierra Leone after acquiring a trade in Jamaica and fulfilling the terms of their indented servitude, while others would remain in Jamaica. Those who remained on the island were already mostly of Maroon origin, and Africans who established themselves within the Jamaican economy. Between 1841 and 1851, Many Sierra Leonean Creoles also went to Trinidad as migrant workers. They would settle in the region of present-day Belmont, but it was originally called Freetown, and they would even have a street called Sierra Leone Road that commemorates the indented service that arrived from Sierra Leone to Trinidad. The greater majority of Creole migrant workers would settle in British Guyana. Indentured African immigrants entered the Caribbean in the following numbers. 13,970 would go to British Guyana. 10,000 would go to Jamaica, 8,390 to Trinidad, 1,540 to Grenada, 1,040 to St. Vincent, 730 to St. Lucia, and 460 would go to St. Kitts. Ancestrally, about 400 of them would come from the crew speaking people of Liberia and Ivory Coast and Sierra Leone. 16,290 of them would come from the islands of St. Helena and 15,630 of them would come directly from Sierra Leone. The Sierra Leonean Creoles predominantly went to Guyana, Jamaica, and Trinidad, while others migrated to other islands at smaller degrees. So overall, the combination of all of these cultures, traditions, and dialects would form the Sierra Leonean Creole community, and also the Creole language spoken amongst them, which had a very strong element of Geechee from South Carolina, Jamaican Patois, Yoruba and native African elements fused together. Genetically, the Sierra Leone and Creole are an amalgamation of many different backgrounds. The admixtures they would receive from the Black Poor of London would consist of various African backgrounds, the Black Moors of England who were originally North African, and small European admixture that would be passed down through some interracial unions. The admixture received from the Black Loyalists consisted of Africans and children of Africans who came from the Bantu of Angola and Congo, the Wolof, Mandinka, Fulani, Jola, and Balanta of Senegambia and Guinea, and the Mende, Shebro, and Timni from Sierra Leone. The Maroons would introduce the Akan, Igbo, and Taino admixtures to the Creole gene pool and the liberated African descendants would introduce the Yoruba and Hausa admixture, as well as other Nigerian ethnic groups at a smaller degree. So let's do a review of how the current Sierra Leonean Creole community was formed through four waves. The first wave, the black loyalists from Virginia, the Carolinas, Georgia, and the New England region of America, who were resettled in Sierra Leone in 1792, via Nova Scotia after giving allegiance to the British against the Americans during the Revolutionary War. The second wave 
with the Maroon rebels from Jamaica who were exiled to Sierra Leone in 1800 via Nova Scotia after the Second Maroon War. It also wasn't uncommon for Maroons and rebels from different Caribbean islands to be exiled to Sierra Leone either. A group of rebels from Barbados would also be exiled to Sierra Leone in 1816 as well, after Boosa's rebellion. And in 1844, the same thing would happen to Afro-Cubans after the conspiracy de la Escalera. The third wave would be the liberated Africans who were Yoruba predominantly along with the Hausa, Igbo, and Afik from Nigeria and the Akan of Ghana who were rescued by the British West African Squadron from being transported across the Atlantic by enslavers who violated the British Anti-Slavery Act after 1807. These recaptives were settled in Sierra Leone as Creole, Gambia as Aku, and Nigeria as Saro. There were also a group of Yoruba who adopted the religion of Islam from traders who came from Mali that settled in Benin and southwest Nigeria. When the Portuguese slave raiders captured them, the West African squadron was not successful in rescuing them, so they made the full voyage to Brazil. These Yoruba, along with the Hausa, started an insurrection called the Mali Revolt. Many Yoruba and Hausa gained their freedom through this revolt and were resettled to Sierra Leone, where they are now known as Fordo Bay people. Some of them would also accompany the sorrow when they began migrating to Nigeria. And this concludes my series on the Sierra Leone people, but there will be more to come. The DNA and history of Sierra Leone comes from revolutionaries who didn't allow their oppressors to subjugate them. We are the people who could not be enslaved or defeated. We are the people who rose from the ashes after every battle and recreated ourselves in our reality. To know thyself is to know your history. In Salon, where they say, if you don't know how you come out, you're not going to know how you go. Like, comment, and subscribe to my channel to stay updated with all future content. Peace, love, and gratitude.